I thank Tom, right? Great, okay, so it is, it is recording, that's, that's absolutely wonderful. Um, so let me start the presentation here. I will share my screen with you and I will walk you through a little bit uh, through what the Opera SP project is about and what it is that we want to uh, achieve with these, with these workshops here. So let me start sharing my screen and I hope that you can see my presentation now. Good. So uh, I, will, I will start with uh, talking a little bit about the Opera SP project. So the OPRAS, and here I always have to write down what the acronym stands for. So uh, I think that most of you is, uh, you are probably uh, already familiar with, with what OPRAS um, is, but just uh, to remind, uh, so OPRAS stands for Open Scholarly Communications in the European Research Area for Social Sciences and Humanities. And um, as part of, um, of OPRAS, um, there is this project which is called OPRAS P and within, uh, it's a big project that consists of several work packages and um, both me and Tom, we work for um, work package six on this project, especially 6.2, which has to do with innovation. So the whole package has to do with innovation and we specifically are looking into business models. So what is going on? in this area when it comes to open access books, what kind of models are in use, what kind of uh, experimental, especially innovative business models that perhaps depart from, from, um, from the very common uh, book processing charges uh, based models. So this is what, what we are looking into. And um, we have started with this project already last year. So I wanted to show you what has been done already because we have, or we have already done a little bit. Um, and for some reason, oh, there you go. Okay, before I, I go into, uh, into what has been done, I also have to uh, admit that we wear many hats. So for this, uh, for this particular workshop, we will be representing Opress, Opress P specifically, but as you know, we all, uh, all the organizers have their own affiliations here. So it's actually a joint uh, project between many different organizations. So we already had Claire uh, explaining about OASPAS involvement. We also have open book publishers involved. In, uh, in the Opera SP project together with OAPEN, the OAB. Um, and uh, we cooperate very closely with the copying project as well. And the last logo here stands for the Open Access Books Network, where both uh, myself, Tom and Lucy, who is going to present later, um, where we also um, uh, contribute to this discussion about, about Open Access Books in general. So, what we have done so far within the Opress P project. So uh, as any good European project, we started with publishing a report, of course. So uh, we published a report on academic libraries um, in Europe and their involvement with open access books. Um, there are two versions of this report out there now. You can uh, access either the living document where uh, everyone is encouraged to comment or the static PDF version is also available online. And um, we already last year were looking into, um, into workshops because we wanted pretty much to, to work with the community. Um, so we had four workshops for uh, academic librarians where we were asking them uh, what kind of challenges they encounter uh, when dealing with open access books. And uh, of course, these, uh, what we learned during these workshops that uh, these, uh, this feedback has also um, been incorporated in, in the report and, uh, and its main findings. And this is what we are working on now because of course the work has not uh, been concluded yet. So um, at the moment we are looking into publishing very soon at the, end of, um, at the end of April actually, we will be publishing a new report. This one will be more focused. Uh, it will be a report on uh, eight uh, chosen uh, case studies which will show different ways of, of um, how publishers uh, public and publish open access models. And um, this report will be based on with representatives of these, of these presses. And some of them are actually with us here today. But this is not all. Uh, we are also working on workshops. And uh, the one that you are presently in is one of the workshops that we have planned for the, for the, the upcoming months. So we are starting today, but there will be uh, two more workshops coming. Uh, we do not have exact dates for these yet. It will be April 
probably in May, but we will definitely keep you updated and I will tell you a little bit more about these workshops in at the end of the at the end of this one, uh, where we will discuss uh, what uh, what they will be focusing on. But for today, what are we going to um, to do today? And of course, these aims uh, stand for all the workshops that uh, we will um, we will um, have. But um, first of all, what we wanted to do, we wanted to facilitate a conversation amongst publishers, amongst publishers that deal with open access books and um, create a platform where they could share their experiences and where they could learn from each other. And um, of course, uh, we would also uh, like to encourage uh, further adoption of these, um, of these models for, uh, for books. We would like to encourage experimentation, especially for these publishers who don't have experience with open access books yet, hopefully. Um, and um, we would uh, specifically like to uh, focus on four more areas that have to do with with uh, models that are applied uh, by publishers that we will we will talk to today. So these four areas are um, revenues, costs, legal affairs, and workflows. Um, and by workflows, we mean production and um, and distribution also. Based on feedback that we we gather from these workshops, um, we will um, hopefully be able to um, to formulate a set of recommendations. Uh, and um, publish these recommendations as, as a shorter uh, form of a report uh, with recommendations for what should be done to make um, each uh, of these models that we will be looking at flourish and um, be sustainable, first of all. Um, so for today. So for today, um, as I mentioned, um, this the first workshop will be a little bit different in nature from the from the upcoming two ones. So this one will be more about information sharing. Uh, we want to give you an overview of, uh, of uh, diverse approaches that are out there when it comes to open access books publishing. And we want to share the lessons that uh, have been learned by people who actually uh, work with these business models on a daily basis. And this is why we invited here today six presenters to give presentations on different business models for open access books. And uh, each presenter will touch on the areas that I mentioned before. So they will talk about their cost and revenue structures. They will talk about legal part of their, um, of their um, initiative. And they will also talk to us about workflows. Each presenter will have 10 minutes to present, and then we will open up the floor for a five minute Q&A session. And uh, here are our guests. Um, so we were expecting six, six presenters today. Unfortunately, one of them could not make it here today. So we will not hear from Martin, Paul, Eve, um, but um, when I uh, hand over to Tom, he will also make sure that um, uh, well, he will not give us a whole presentation that Martin would, would have, uh, but will point you to some uh, material that you can look at online for now. But uh, we still have five uh, absolutely tremendous speakers for, for uh, our afternoon here today. So first of all, we have Sebastian Nordov. And Sebastian, of course, I have to mention all of these speakers, again, they also wear many hats, but I am only going to focus today on their uh, under one role, which is relevant for this particular workshop. So Sebastian Nordov um, is a linguist and he's a co coordinator of Language uh, Science Press. Um, this, is the, uh, this is a scholarly, scholar-led publishing house which specializes in books and linguistics. So, herzlich uh, willkommen, Sebastian. Uh, next in line, we have Niklas Allen, and Niklas uh, is representing um, the publishing house of the Finnish Literature Society, which is uh, a learned society that was founded a long time ago in 1831, and uh, it is the largest scholarly publisher in the area of humanities in, in Finland. So, uh, Nicholas, I was really trying to learn how to say good afternoon in Finnish, but that surpassed my linguistic abilities, so sorry for that. And then we have Eva. Uh, then we have Eva Melinsaks-Lodi. Sorry, were you just saying how to say it? Okay. Actually, rather good. Okay, great. Yeah. <laughs> great. So, Eva, uh, Eva, so, dobar dan. Good. 
Great. Uh, so Eva is representing FF Open Press, which is a press, um, associated with the Faculty of Philosophy at the University of Zagreb. Um, and uh, Eva is representing uh, Croatia for us today. Uh, next, we have Lucy Barnes. And Lucy is the editor and outreach coordinator for Open Book Publishers, which is an independent <laughs> nonprofit publisher based in the UK. Hello, Lucy. <laughs> And last, we have Fulvio Guatelli, who is here representing the Firenze University Press, which is the department of the University of Florence. Benvenuto, Fulvio. And I think that at this point, uh, Tom, uh, I will hand it over to you and um, let's start the presentations. Thank you so much. Yes, um, thanks a lot, uh, Agatha. And I see Sebastian is already... Uh, uh, ready actually to begin and um, before we uh, we start with the presentations just a few um, quick words that we will have uh, five ten minute presentations I see Sebastian sh shared also the link to his uh, presentation in the chat uh, for those who want to have a look at it now or later online um, and you can uh, share any questions that you have uh, during the presentation or the five minute Q&A we will have after each of the presentations um, but also if you have uh, questions when we enter into a new presentation, please feel free to keep previous questions coming in the chat and the presenters can also answer them in the chat then uh, since um, yeah, the Q&A time is uh, relatively short and we have uh, a lot of people here today. Um, so then, yeah, without uh, further ado, I would like to hand over to uh, Sebastian. Yeah, hello everybody. I have to unmute to, uh, I had to unshare my screen to be able to unmute myself, but I hope that's fine. So I hope that everybody can hear me and that you can see the presentation. Uh, thank you all for inviting me today. So I will present Language Science Press and go to those four areas Agatha mentioned. So first, some words about Language Science Press. Uh, Language Science Press was founded in 2014. Uh, we are a diamond open access publisher, which means we have no author facing fees and we have no reader facing fees. We publish only books, no journals, and we publish only linguistics and we publish only CC BY. As of today, we have published 150 books that uh, includes monographs and edited volumes. So if we take the chapter authors of edited volumes and the authors of monographs, we arrive at 1,000, well, more than 1,000 different people who have uh, published something with Language Science Press. As of January this year, we have slightly over 1 million PDF downloads, and the most downloaded books we have are at 60,000 something downloads. Uh, that's a textbook in Portuguese, actually. That's quite interesting. Um, so Language Science Press is a discipline specific publisher. So it's specific for the discipline of linguistics, which makes it different from whatever the University of Cologne Press or something, which would be specific to a region, namely Cologne. It's an international publisher. So our authors come from Europe, they come from the US, they come from Africa. We have one from uh, Oman, I believe, Australia and so on. And I think we can say that we have the, the core values are excellence, transparency, and collaboration. So we only publish very high quality research. We want to make the whole process as open as uh, possible. So if you have open review, open source, open access, open what have you, normally we, we tick all the boxes. And we have a collaborative community led approach to publishing. In our initial grant, we had a position for uh, an economist and together with her, uh, we developed uh, a business model uh, and I will paste the link there as well in the chat. So later uh, we wrote that up into the cookbook for open access books so that other people can replicate what we did. And we also published our initial 2015 business model. Uh, 
which is annotated because we also said here we failed. So th this was our plan and this is how it worked out. And as it turns out, no plan survives contact with reality. So that's the case here as well. So I invite you to read those items. It's very interesting and more in depth than what I can present here today. Uh, as far as our revenue is concerned, so that's the first block. In 2020, we had a total revenue of 113,000 euros. Uh, we have no subsidies from universities and also no subsidies in kind. So we pay all our staff, we pay all our rooms, we pay our electricity and everything. So those 113,000 euros come from 105,000 via Knowledge Unleashed, and that's 105,000 different institutions worldwide, which all contribute 1,000 euros. So whatever, that's the University of Frankfurt, and that's the University of Berkeley, and that's the University of Sheffield, and that's the University of Innsbruck, and all those, they, they contribute 1,000 each. Um, so altogether, that's 105,000. And then we have 8,000 various revenue little things like print margin, some donations. We take some BPCs if authors have the money and they want extra services with typesetting or uh, figure drawing or maps or something. But altogether, it, it's really not a huge amount. In our business model, we had analyzed other revenue streams, which are the private donations, private memberships, book processing charges, and print margins. But all of those prove to be not really viable and they don't contribute a lot. That's also explained in more detail in the business model I mentioned before. So if you want to delve into more detail into that, I invite you again to go there. Um, as for the costs, in 2020, we had 120,000 costs, euros costs. That's 90,000 euros for salaries, 6,000 euros for rent, and 20,000 for service providers. Uh, one thing which is particular for Language Science Press is we uh, have a very lean setup. So we have no warehousing, we have no marketing, we have no paywalls because everything is open access, which also means that we have no pay paywall maintenance. We don't have to hire programmers to do whatever protect us against breaches or do stuff like that. We pay no royalties, which means we have no legal department and we also have no invoicing because all that basically is a big zero all over the place. So you don't have to, to do a lot of accounting here. Um, as for the legal form, so our, the way we are constituted, we thought about that in quite some detail in 2014 and 2015. And there are different legal forms which have different advantages with regard to flexibility on the one side and the fact of being non-commercial on the other side. So that gives you a two by two table, which you see below. And you can either be more commercial or less commercial, or you could be more flexible in your daily dealings, or you could be less flexible. So for instance, a university would be non-commercial, which is nice, but it's not very flexible as all of us who have dealt with universities in the past might have known. So if you want the university to take a decision that can take weeks or months, um, another possibility would be something which in Germany is called a Verein. So that's an association in some country that might be a chartered something, something. Uh, which is also non-commercial, but it's not very flexible because in Germany you need the annual general meeting for you to decide stuff. So you cannot do stuff just like that. On the more flexible side, you have the what in Germany is the GmbH, which would translate as limited in other jurisdictions. And we have a Unternehmergesellschaft UG, which is a micro limited. So a limited has a capital of 25,000 euros or more. A lim micro limited has a capital of one euro or more. So it's rather easy to fund to, uh, fund and found such a micro limited, but it's commercial. So if we do that, then we are in the commercial sector. We could be bought out by other commercial players. Then Springer comes along and they buy Language Science Press and all of a sudden uh, we are in the commercial domain. That's not what we want. And then there's an interesting thing in, in Germany, which is the charitable micro limited, the GUG, and this is what we are. So we have the advantage of being flexible, 
So I, as the manag managing director, I can just send invoices and I can sign contracts and so on. But at the same time, we are charitable and we cannot be bought. So if ever some, if ever we lost our charitable status, all of our assets would have to go to something else, which is a charity, right? So that, that's a very interesting setup. And it works for Germany, but in other jurisdictions, it might be completely different. Right? So another legal aspect is the brand. So we have paid a designer to develop our brand and we registered our trademark and logo. And we can only stress that it's important that don't sell your brand. Even if you use service providers somewhere, if someone says, yeah, we'll do everything for you. We you do typesep typesetting, we organize the review and so on. You can outsource all of that, but you must at all prices keep the brand because then you can change the service providers later on. Once you've sold the brand, then they, they got you. Right? As for workflows, um, we are a community-based publisher. So we have 29 autonomous series, uh, which organize peer review. So that's one series for phonology, another one for morphology, another one for African studies and so on. And they decide autonomously what's good research in their particular area. We have something which is rather special that's community proofreading. So we have 400 community proofreaders and every other Monday, I send a new book out to them and I ask them, would you like to read a chapter? And then whatever, 20 or 30 or so say, yeah, I'd like to read a chapter. Uh, we have a very streamlined and automated workflow. Uh, we use standard, tem standard templates and authors don't have a lot of leeway to deviate from them, which keeps our costs low. Uh, an interesting feature maybe is that we do not use XML which has to do with the way how linguistics works. So it's not very XML friendly as a discipline. Uh, we have a conversion pipeline. So the people who don't know LaTeX can use our word templates and then it's trans um, converted. And later it's uploaded to Overleaf, which is a collaborative platform similar to Google Docs, but for LaTeX documents where then authors and typesetters can jointly work on a book project. And our primary distribution channel is digital, but we also offer print on demand via BOD and yeah, whatever typical price would be 30 or 40 euros for a book. Uh, we automate most processes as far as we can. So we have the doc to tech conversion. We have automatic checking whether the tech the people produce conforms to our guidelines. We store our stuff on Zenodo, the repository. The repository has an API, so we have a, a small script which uploads our stuff to Zenodo. We don't have to do that by hand. We upload the stuff to print on demand. Also, 90% automated, little, very little manual intervention required. And the report generation and whatever the charts, how many books have been downloaded when, and so that's also automatic. And we're lucky enough to have sufficient programming expertise in-house. Mm -hmm. As for dissemination, um, our digital version, that's the primary mode of, of distribution, uh, they are available from our website. But actually, we host them now on Zenodo. So it's just a link to Zenodo. So Zenodo does also the long time archiving for us. They are available via all those other uh, platforms mentioned here. So DOAB, OAPEN, GitHub, Paperhive, Google Books. And some of our stuff is indexed in EBSCO and Scopus. We hope Scopus is very difficult to deal with, but in principle, it should be there. Our printed books are available via the VLB, which means they are available in bookstores in Germany and uh, Austria just via the regular, you go to a bookstore and you say you want that book and normally you get it uh, after some time. Or you could also order it via Amazon. Our books are announced on Twitter, Facebook, linguist list and discipline specific mailing lists. Uh, we are not a publisher who is in search of a community, but we are a community who was in search of a publisher. So basically we don't have to do outreach to the community because we are the community which also means we don't have to do marketing because all the morphologists are on the morphology mailing lists anyway, and the phonologists are on the phonology mailing lists anyway, right? So we don't really do marketing. We don't do that. This is conference jet set. We don't do that. 
Um, we sell, uh, as for figures, we sell about 700 books a year. So that's for 2020. And we have about 500,000 PDF downloads a year. So the ratio is about one to thousand. There's a thousand more PDF downloads than printed books. So yeah, printed books are really a niche product for us. Um, we all wear different hats, as Agata said. So I have a different hat as well. I also work at the TEB Hannover in a new project just started last week. It's called Koala Konsortiale Open Access Lösung Aufbauen. So that's about establishing consortial OA solutions, which is basically what Language Science Press has done for the last seven years. It's about getting disciplines and getting publishers to provide a platform without author-facing charges and without reader-facing charges, but still find a way to meet your costs, right? So the goal is to provide a blueprint for consortial funding for scholarly presses, of which maybe today we have some here. So if you're looking for some way to get your content funded via a consortial model, I would invite you to get in touch with me. My address is there. I'll copy it in the chat. And you can also read a very short project description on the link uh, given here. And if you write me an email, you make a, you have a chance of being included in the pilot. So uh, then we'll make sure well, that we get a nice representation of different disciplines and so on for this pilot study. And that's the end of the talk. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Um, thanks very much, uh, Sebastian, and um, for for this information. And at least I learned something new about uh, legal forms in Germany. Maybe this uh, yeah. will be a new interest uh, for myself. Um, we now have a, a few minutes for the uh, Q and A, so uh, please feel free to uh, unmute yourself or add write your questions into the um, chat. Um, I see Sebastian answered the, the first question whether uh, the particular type of presses that are welcome. And um, if anyone would like to uh, jump in, please feel free to do so. Um, but as I see, there are no other questions yet. I think just a quick question for me, Sebastian. Um, so you have published around 150 books uh, so far with Language Science Press. And um, it, in terms of revenue and, and costs and workflows, it all looks uh, very efficient. But I wondered, has the press uh, ever considered publishing both open access and also non-open access books? So as I said, we have a lean setup. We have no legal team. We have no paywalls. If we published um, non-open access books, we had, would have to establish some paywalls. We would have to have some user management. We would have to have some billing. We would have to have someone who checks whether Tom Mostert, who's re registered with us, whether he did pay his fees this year, right? And that's a lot of overhead. So Björn Brems argues that most of the money we pay to closed access publishers actually goes into paywalls because it's, it's very, very expensive to, to get paywalls there. It's very cheap to put just your PDF up there. But if you want to protect your PDF, but still give grant access to uh, selected amount of selected people. It, it's very expensive. It's very complex. Um, um, thanks, and I see there's. I'll just um, and try to raise the questions in the chat here, Sebastian. So, uh, the first question here: um, How confident are you that your model is uh, sustainable? Okay, so we ran the first model in. So we have a three-year funding period. So it was 2018, 2019, 2020. That funding period has just ended and we had 105 members. And then we approached those members again last year and said, would you want to renew? And some people dropped out, but we got some new members. And so we targeted 115 and we got those 115. So apparently the libraries are happy with, with the stuff we provided. We promised them 90 books, we delivered 90 books. So that works well. Uh, we, as I said, we get no subsidies in kind. We get no subsidies in, um, in, in money. So I'm pretty sure that our revenues meet our costs. So there's no, no hidden subsidies in there. So, so I do think it's sustainable. I don't know to what extent it's replicable to other disciplines because it depends on your setup. It depends on the public, publication culture to the close-knittedness of your community and so on. 
Okay, thanks. And I'm going to, I see there are more questions. I'm just going to ask uh, one now before we move to the next uh, presentation. But then Sebastian can uh, certainly answer the further questions in the chat. Um, so the, the last one for now, Sebastian, could you talk a bit more about the consortium model? And I'm going to assume here that this refers to your last uh, slide. Um, and if not, um, please correct me in the, the chat, whoever uh, raised the question. Okay, so, well, you, the tra very traditional way of meeting the costs for scientific publication is author pays, just you pay for the book and then the publisher makes some money and can meet its costs. Um, then you get the, the author pays model where you have author processing charges or book processing charges. And the consortium model would be that interested parties, mostly libraries, join forces and they say, we all give 1000 euros to make things work, right? And for that, we fund the platform and independent from us, the scholars decide what's to be published on that platform. Now in this um, new project of mine, the idea would be to provide a blueprint for such a setup. And that involves some kind of legal questions, some kind of taxation questions, who is a member, what are the intervals, and, and some technical setup, the library people want to have good metadata, they want to have a long term archiving solutions. So there are a couple of successful models which work like that, like the Open Library of Humanities, like Language Science Press, but we want to have a generic setup and we would like to get in touch with many different people so that we can provide a good setup which is not too specific to, for instance, linguistics, but also a, a setup which works for physics or which works for archaeology and so on. That would be for the consortium model at, at the Koala model. Thank and you. I can, uh, again, just repeat the invitation to get in touch if you want to like, would like to know more about that or be part of it or something. Very interesting. Um, and, and good luck with that, uh, Sebastian. And um, yeah, please uh, keep the questions coming in, in the chat and Sebastian can answer them. Um, but now I would also like to welcome our uh, next speaker, Nekats um, Alain from the uh, Finnish Literature Society. And um, Nicholas, if you would like to uh, share your screen. And um, yes. Yeah, please feel free to uh, take it away. Well, yes, thank you. Yeah, I can see your screen now. Great. Uh, just one second. Okay, so. Uh, my name is Nicholas Alain and I am a project coordinator at the Finnish Literature Society and today I have the pleasure to present to you our open access uh, publishing program as well as give you an insight into our open access monograph production. Uh, to start off, uh, let me first quickly introduce you to the society. Uh, the society was founded in 1831 by scholars at the, at the Helsinki University. And in 1834, the society published its first uh, title. And in 1835, uh, we published the Finnish national epic, the Kalevala. In 1870, we published the first Finnish language novel, and since then, our publishing program has been more focused on scholarly publishing. Uh, in 2014, the society started a project, which goal was to establish what open access could offer our publishing activity. The project found that a move to open access would most likely improve the visibility, discoverability and dissemination of our titles at a cost of a decrease in book sales. And in 2016, the society decided to pilot open access publishing with one of our English language series, the Studia Fennica series. And this, starting this year, we made the decision that all of our scholarly series will be made 
uh, open access. So uh, how has open access impacted our publishing program? Well, when it comes to workflows, uh, it has added some additional layers to the overall process. In addition to our double blind peer review, copy editing, typesetting, graphical design and book printing, of course, we now also host a platform that provides the open access versions of our books in PDF and EPUB file formats. So this is our open access publication platform and all books are uploaded here. From here, uh, the scholar can read the book online uh, or download it for themselves in EPUB or PDF uh, file formats or alternatively buy it uh, through print on demand. All of our books are also assigned a permanent identifier. Uh, we use uh, Crossref's uh, digital object identifiers for this. And on this page, there is also additional information concerning the uh, book and also some metrics uh, about the book. So here you can see how many times this book has been viewed and downloaded. Uh, to uh, ensure the visibility, uh, but in, in, in addition to this, uh, we are also uh, trying to uh, enhance the discoverability of our titles. And for this, we currently use the following uh, channels. So uh, the books are available for anyone to read on our open access platform, but the books are also indexed in different uh, library databases by our library and scholars can access the books that way, as well as through a national, a national uh, discovery service called Finna. And in addition to this, our books are also uh, indexed in the directory of open access books and JSTOR. And last but not least, the books are also indexed in OAPEN, which allows many different ways uh, for uh, readers to find our books. So they can use uh, OAPEN straight, straight away or access uh, the metadata through uh, search engines uh, such as the Bielefeld Academic Search Engine or uh, WorldCat. And as a result of uh, this work, our titles were last year read in 186 countries, uh, which you can see here on this Coroplet map. Um, we have a very good uh, readership here in Europe, as well as in Asia and North America and South America, and also uh, quite a lot of readers in Africa. Uh, and here you can see uh, the downloads for our books. And the downloads have also uh, increased uh, every year very well. So last year we had over 40,000 downloads of our open access titles. So clearly open access has de delivered a better visibility for our titles. Uh, on the other hand, it has also decreased uh, our book sales. And as a consequence, we have to use a, a book processing charge currently to offset some of our uh, costs. Our charge is uh, 6,000 euros, but it is only charged if the author has a grant 
or other funding that allows for open access publish publishing charges. Uh, in all other cases, uh, the charge is automatically waived. A book processing charge is therefore never, never a prerequisite for publishing in any of our series. Uh, we have also piloted uh, different funding models for open access monograph publishing. Uh, in 2016, we partnered with uh, the Helsinki University Library in order to publish a certain portion of our backlist in open access. We also uh, piloted a library consortium called Alexandria. Uh, the consortium was modeled on the successful knowledge unlatched model. And its goal was to offer a funding mechanism suited for Finnish language open access monographs. The idea was to create a funding mechanism that would iteratively adapt to better fit uh, our domestic publishing ecosystem. Uh, the pilot, uh, as I mentioned, the pilot followed the general idea of uh, knowledge unlatched. So publishers were offered a possibility to have their titles funded by the consortium and the costs were then directly proportionate to the number of uh, libraries that would take part in the consortium. So uh, the titles for the pilot were offered by us, the Finnish Literature Society, and six academic libraries uh, the university libraries of Helsinki, Jyväskylä, Oulu, Turku, Obu Academy, and our own library uh, joined to uh, to borrow the knowledge of uh, the language of knowledge and latch to unlatch these titles, as well as the consortium of Finnish libraries, uh, who also took part in the funding. The pilot uh, proved that there is a lot of interest to work together in developing funding mechanisms, uh, but also that the small size of Finland, the small language area and the specialized topics also meant that very few libraries were able and willing to contribute financially and uh, therefore the pilot was not extended to a second round. Uh, we do, however, still continue to wor work with different Finnish initiatives to develop future mechanisms, and we are hopeful in this regard. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Nicholas, for this um, the presentation and sharing more about the Finnish Lit Literature Society and the approach to open access book publishing. Uh, once again, the chat is open for any questions. And I'll just um, begin with uh, one question here um, uh, to, to you, Nicholas. Um, so you publish books in a, a very specialized area, and uh, as you also showed, and do you find this narrow focus to be an advantage or a challenge when it comes to publishing open access books? Are, are you still here, Nicholas? I, I cannot hear you. Could also be that it's on my end here. You do seem unmuted, but. Tom, your question was just, just breathtaking, I guess. Nicholas, are you okay? Are you still with us? Hello, Finland. Well, otherwise let's give it a few minutes to see. Um, Oh, Nicholas is here. Nicholas, um, I, we cannot hear you. Um,
I think that Nicholas signed out and he will try to come back to us. That's how it looks like. So um, let's hope this, this will still work. If not, then we can come back to Nicholas at the end and just... Yes, I think in, in the interest of time, I will just uh, yeah, continue let's briefly and then we can come back to it in, in a bit. Um, so actually now um, we would have moved to uh, the third presentation, which would be by uh, Martin Paul Eve. Uh, but as Agatha mentioned, he unfortunately could not uh, be here uh, today. So instead, we wanted to uh, reserve a, a few minutes to uh, at least share some information about the model. And I'm uh, certain that uh, after this event and in the coming weeks, we can share perhaps some slides and additional information for all of you who would be interested in the, in the model. Um, but we also have someone here who would like to uh, say a bit more about the model, and uh, that won't be me, but that will be uh, Dr. Francis Pinter, who also uh, is implementing the model, opening the future for the Central European uh, University Press. And um, yeah, with that, I would like to hand over to Francis for just a few uh, minutes and feel free to unmute yourself and then take over Francis uh, if you'd like. Okay. Um, I think I'm unmuted, but how do I, am I on screen for yes. you? Yeah. Okay. I see you, but I, in the big picture, but I hope other people can see me somehow. Um, uh, hello. I, it's only been in the last couple of minutes that I realized that Martin wasn't going to be here. So I'm taking this on very much in the last, uh, minute, but, um, the model that he would have, uh, presented to you is one that COPIM have been working on, which is a subscribe to open uh, idea for small and medium sized university presses and mission led university presses, uh, mission led uh, types of non commercial presses, which COPIM and, and, and I agree, uh, feel are appropriate, especially for, for small and medium sized companies that have a strong backlist, a backlist that can be leveraged uh, by a subscribe to open model. And what we mean by that is that basically the, um, the money that we're asking of libraries to become a member of the opening the future model, which is what it's called, goes towards funding new books. And it's very much dependent on how many libraries we can get to join. Uh, the fees depend on the size of the institution. It ranges from 350 euros to 1200 euros a year. And we ask for a three year commitment. And in exchange, what uh, presses such as the Central European University Press is offering is a package, and actually it's a choice of four packages, of books that during those three years, the um, libraries have uh, term access, and at the end of the three years, it, they have perpetual access to those books. So the more libraries we get on board, the less expensive it is um, for funding new book books and the libraries get more and more for the fixed amount that they are paying because we're applying more and more money to new books. Now, with the CU Press, we're aiming at having uh, 25 new books funded each year through this mechanism. And for that, the package uh, that is on offer is 50 um, backlist titles. And they've been selected in a variety of ways, which I'll, I encourage you to go and look at the, the site to see how we've, we've done that. Um, we're hoping that this model will scale and we're looking again, like everybody else is uh, looking for ways of making uh, a, a particular model work. Uh, for more than one organization. Uh, we think that something like an open access book hub mm. would be a place where uh, 
publishers uh, could come and, and, and show their wares, show their books, and libraries could come and uh, select from uh, this collection of uh, books from small and medium size um, presses. So it's a subscribe to open with a membership twist to it. Uh, and I'm so sorry that Martin couldn't join us because he's much better at ex tell, explaining the business model. But if Tom, you could circulate the slides um, that you, I know you do have uh, from him or, or no, the, the links, that would be terrific uh, because uh, I really would encourage everybody to take a look. We're keeping our fingers crossed because if this works for a particular type of press, uh, it would make a, a, a big contribution to accelerating getting to open access for books. Thank you very much for giving me the floor, Tom. Thanks very much, Francis, for um, yeah for speaking to the the model and um, yeah uh, being here and uh, offering to 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 share something really on on last minute. I uh, shared the uh, link to the the latest presentation uh, by Francis and Martin actually from last November at the Munich conference in the chat, uh, and there they go into more detail about the model. And there's also a link in the chat currently uh, to the website. Um, and I yeah, would definitely recommend uh, you all to, to have a look at this new innovative model and this approach to uh, open access books. Uh, and as mentioned, we will, um, in, in, after the session, certainly come back to you with uh, slides and, and details in the coming weeks. Um, Thank yeah, th th thanks a lot, for, uh, Francis. I, I also see that uh, Nicholas is... Uh, here again, um, and um, I can I can see you, Nicholas, and uh, hopefully uh, you can also hear us. Uh, and then I would actually now like to uh, come back to to your presentation and uh, ask the audience if they would like to uh, ask any questions on the Finnish Literature Society and its approach to open access book publishing. And um, I'm sure Agatha will send me a message if any questions do come up. But uh, for now, perhaps a question I asked earlier, Nicholas, uh, when we unfortunately lost you, um, which, which was that um, the Finnish Literature Society publishes uh, books in a, a very specialized area. And my question was whether you find this narrow focus to be uh, an advantage uh, or a challenge when it comes to publishing open access books. Nicholas, I think that there is something wrong with your microphone because we can see you speaking, but unfortunately we can't hear you. That's too bad. No, sorry, we still cannot hear you, I'm afraid. Um, perhaps it would also be an, an option, Nicholas, if we, um, if, if you would like to answer the, the question via the chat. Tom, perhaps we can move on with the next speaker and then we'll come back to Nicholas's answer. Otherwise, I think yes. it's too much pressure on him as, as I don't know how quickly he can type, but maybe let's give him some time. Of course. I'm just going to paste my question then in the uh, uh, chat uh, for all to see and for you, Nicholas. And please feel free to reply in the, in the chat. And if anyone else has other questions, please feel free to use the chat. And then we will move on to the, uh, the next presentation, um, which will be by uh, Eva from the FF Open Press. Um, so yeah, please uh, feel free to begin, Eva. Okay, I will share my screen. Just a moment. Okay. Uh, 
so uh, I will talk today about the FF Open Press, which is a platform of uh, for open access books from the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences or the Faculty of Philosophy. It works either way. Uh, from the as a part of University of Zagreb, and I will try to uh, sum up uh, the answers to the four questions that you answered uh, when. Uh, imagining this uh, session. So, uh, but before that, I would like to stress that, uh, that what I'm going to talk about is probably be much different from what uh, presenters from Open Library of Humanities, unfortunately, Paul Martin Eve is not here today, or Sebastian, or later Lucy Barnes from Open Book uh, Publishers. Uh, are going to present because uh, we work in a very different setting and I'm afraid that uh, the business model that I'm going to talk about is not something that can be replicated as a recipe for other presses, but it is probably interesting to see that something like that also exists in the European net, uh, landscapes and that is something that also can work and probably there are ways to make it work even better. But before going uh, further, I had the uh, wish to put this very cliche meme, but just to stress that our business model is really something very, very different. I uh, enjoyed uh, listening to Sebastian and the language science press model, but something like that is really uh, definitely not replicable in the institutional setting uh, that I come from. So let me start and give you some introduction to the FF Open Press. It is actually a platform for open access books. It was launched uh, two years ago, so we are still uh, very, very fresh. At least we feel that we are just starting. Um, we are situated at the faculty, which is the constituent part of the University of Zagreb. So we cannot really call ourselves uh, university press. We are just a part of the university and it's uh, even this uh, context of universities and faculties in Croatia is rather unusual for people outside of this uh, area. Uh, so this faculty is a rather uh, uh, independent legal uh, entity. Uh, and the platform FF Open Press was actually brought to life in collaboration with the FF Press, which is the publishing department at the faculty, together with the library. So uh, the FF Press itself, so this publishing unit, uh, exists from 2002 and it used to be very small and very traditionally oriented uh, press. They only published uh, printed books uh, and uh, it was very, very small. Uh, they published around 30, uh, 30 titles per year, mostly monographs, edited collections, conference proceedings and textbooks and some 10 journals that, uh, and I have to stress that uh, unlike books uh, that were only uh, printed, uh, journals in Croatia are almost all uh, available in open access for a long time now. We have a national platform called Herchak, so the situa situation with the journals is much different than the situation with books. And when we started, uh, when we launched this uh, FF Open Press platform, we uh, used uh, PKP Open Monograph Press as the software that was free, that was open access, and it was available to us to start using it without any costs. So how, when we talk about the revenue uh, and the way we, uh, we cover our costs, and uh, I will not talk about earning or profit because that is definitely not the goal. We are a part of a nonprofit uh, institution. Uh, we have to stress that we operate um, in a very different environment, larger, and the main issue with that is actually the issue of language. Most of the books uh, we publish are published in Croatian, although not all. There is a number of titles in English and in some other European languages. 
And of course, there is a number of titles that are being published uh, in a bilingual edition, for instance, Croatian uh, and English or Croatian and Hungarian, for instance, in parallel. But uh, in any case, the readership of uh, each title that is not in English is very, very limited. So this is something we, when we uh, think about the revenues, possible revenue sources, we have to have in mind that it we cannot depend on a market because uh, the number of potential readers is not uh, sufficient to make it mark, uh, viable commercially. So all the book publishing in Croatia, and this is not just the issue with scholarly publishing, but of course uh, scholarly editions are even more dependent on the subsidies. Uh, they come either from the Ministry of Science or from the Ministry of Culture. And besides subsidy, there is also a program of public purchases of uh, books for libraries. I don't know uh, if that is something that is common in some other countries, but for instance, in Croatia, we have this very strong, uh, strong tradition of public, uh, the Ministry of Culture will, uh, finance uh, public purchases for libraries of the titles of Croatian publishers. So this is something that, uh, that presents the main sources uh, of revenue. Uh, so if we really have to enumerate the sources, those are selling print copies. And of course there are some, uh, some kinds of books that are more commercially viable. Those are textbooks. Uh, and they would not be a good candidates for open access, but for instance, edited volumes or conference proceedings when even uh, authors don't receive any kind of profit from selling those copies, they are excellent candidates for open access because there is absolutely no interest for keeping them away from open access. Uh, there is also an issue of selling e-copies. We don't do that, we don't intend to do that. Uh, besides being having a very small markets, there isn't even a viable uh, market solution for selling uh, uh, non-scholarly books in Croatia. But everything that Sebastian previously talked about, about maintaining paywalls and being uh, having them very expensive, uh, such a system is not something that we can actually establish and having it uh, commercially viable. And by the way, we don't want to do, we want to have open access books actually. Uh, and finally, we rely very heav heavily on the system of public subsidies, uh, primarily from the Ministry of Science and Education. There is a special line for subsidies for books. And unfortunately, currently, uh, it doesn't require open access um, as a criteria for financing which is uh, different from the situation with journals. They have to be in open access to have uh, the public subsidy. Also, there is a Ministry of Culture and Croatian Academy, some local public funders. So this is, there isn't so many different sources, but there are a few and we rely heavily on them when publishing uh, books. And of course, everything that is related to uh, maintaining the platform and making open access book uh, happen uh, is uh, related to in-kind contributions either from this FF Press unit or from library or from editors uh, that come from, as members of the faculty. Uh, for So as I mentioned, there is no public program subsidies that are dedicated to uh, open access books specifically. Uh, there, is a, uh, there are subsidies for books in general. Uh, we also, as I mentioned, we are using a free software for, you, uh, for building this platform. We have in-kind contributions by the library staff. And we actually have to stress that we view these uh, open access uh, additions at the moment mostly as a supplement or an uh, addition to the print uh, uh, to the print versions. We hope uh, that is going to change, and this is already starting to happen. More and more authors are uh, trying to have them their books published as e only. So this is a good sign and then they will be um, in open access only. 
but we also have to think uh, about uh, another uh, revenue sources that will enable us to uh, apply some more advanced functionalities of the plat platform to have more uh, a different kind of additions and to be more uh, to disseminate more widely the books that we publish about the governance and the personnel this these are some figures that show you that we are really uh, assembled uh, a small group of people people in the publishing departments they are permanent staff but people that uh, from the library that take care of the open access uh, publishing. We are not actually, all of us are working that just as our part-time, including the IT support from the library. So this is not maybe, in the long time, uh, it is not going to uh, work very really easily like that. Uh, about the cost, uh, most of the costs are tied to preparation on um, production of print books. Some of the functions uh, of uh, production and this, uh, distributions are also outsourced, outsource, but not all. Uh, and there are some special costs related to open access editions, and they are mostly covered by in-kind contributions from the library, except for cross-rep membership, of course, that has to be paid. Uh, about the legal issues, now I'm not really sure. Uh, Sebastian talked more about the legal establishment of the press, and I assumed maybe wrongly that it has to be about the licensing and the copyright. But I will say, anyway, I will say a few words about that. Uh, the books that we publish, we publish them under uh, uh, creative copyright licenses. We decided to go for uh, the least. Uh, the one that is leased freely, uh, non-commercial, non-derivative. We hope to maybe revise this uh, decision in the future and to go for some more open license. Uh, for author mon mon monographs, we need authors to sign an agreement, copyright agreement with the, with the faculty, and they accept to be published uh, under creative copyright license. And for edited volumes, uh, there is no real uh, copyright agreement. Uh, the authors of certain chapters or papers have to uh, sign the, uh, a statement where, again, they accept to be published under this uh, license. And the copyright for uh, edited volumes is retained by the authors always. Uh, the problem for us, and I, uh, I don't know what is it like for other university presses that are going into programs of making older books available uh, in open access, is of course uh, having, uh, um, having ac acceptance from the authors uh, to be published in open access and especially under uh, Creative Commons licenses. Uh, because in many cases, though, there is a large number of uh, authors that have to accept it. So we decided to publish older volumes without the license. Uh, and just we are just using the statement that it is copyrighted and you use the rights based statements vocabulary from Europeana. And about the workflows. Uh, I maybe should mention that what is uh, happening uh, at the moment is that we uh, can see that open access options for authors is more and more accepted. Uh, there are only several uh, cases of authors choosing not to have them, not to have their uh, <laughs> books published in open access. Either those are uh, textbooks that will be sold commercially or do we have some problems with translations or illustrations uh, and we don't have copyright cleared for them. Uh, and there is also the issue of dissemination. Uh, besides uh, our own platform, we should uh, probably invest more in dissemination, uh, in disseminating the content more broadly. We have issues with uh, Google Scholar and Google Books, which is specific to Croatia. Again, we don't have access to Google Play, so we cannot uh, put our books in Google uh, Google products yet, but it's 
probably going to be solved in some uh, sometime. So when we talk about our future priorities, I'm probably already out of time, but I have to stress that we are going to uh, work more on uh, the dissemination and also on digitizing older editions. Uh, I would like to, uh, well, uh, this is one question. If I can, uh, if, if I can use uh, part of my question time to ask questions to the audience, maybe. Uh, one thing that is specific for us probably is that we work in collaboration with the library and the libraries are the, the type of heritage institutions that under this new directive of co on copyright have the right to dig digitize older out of commerce uh, materials, including books. And this is uh, something that we intend to work more uh, more uh, intensely in the future because there are many old books uh, published, for instance, by our faculty or by some associated presses that are, that don't have cleared copyright uh, status, that are out of commerce, and this new directive on copyright gives libraries the right to digitize them. And of course, there is a very thin line, and actually, I'm not sure I can uh, see where is exactly this line between digitizing and publishing. So when is it, uh, can we actually publish these books, uh, have the new editions uh, <laughs> if they are out of commerce? I see that this is a wide space for libraries and other uh, heritage institutions that can maybe partner with some uh, presses and work more on making older books available now in open access. Okay, thank you. I, I did finish, not quite in time, but I... Uh, thanks a lot, Eva, for the presentation and uh, for um, asking your, the question also to the audience. And uh, it's completely fine, in, I think, in terms of time. It does not leave us which, much time for a live Q&A, but I see the chat is being used uh, quite a lot. So people can ask their questions there. Um, and also, uh, I think on the, the legal part of your presentation, that was actually just great because we intended to cover that in a very broad and open way. So uh, that can be about legal forms, but also legal issues. Um, so thanks for, for that. Um, so I think then, uh, yeah, looking at, at the clock, if anyone has any questions for Eva, please feel free to share them uh, in the chat. Um, and then I would now like to hand over to uh, Lucy Barnes from Open Book Publishers, who will uh, be presenting uh, next. Hi, everyone. Uh, just sharing the screen. I'm assuming you can all see that. Shout me if you can't. Um, so my name is Lucy Barnes, and uh, I work at Open Book Publishers um, as an editor and also on outreach. I was also drafted in slightly last minute to work on this, so um, please forgive any gaps or deficiencies in my presentation. Um, so today I'm gonna to talk about ODP, um, I'm gonna talk about our publishing revenue and costs, and I'm gonna talk about distribution and licenses, so broadly covering the same areas as everybody else. Um, so ODP is a non-profit, we're actually a community interest company, uh, which I think is it's a designation, we can't be charitable because we make revenue from selling books, um, but we everything that we, in terms of our profit, anything that we make as a profit has to be reinvested into the social objectives of the company. So this is a specific legal framework that ensures that that's what we do. Um, we were founded in 2008, we've been going comparatively for, for a while, and uh, ODP was founded by academics, so it's a scholar-led press. And the objective is to make um, high quality peer reviewed research as available as broadly um, and as widely as possible. So everything that we publish is open access. There's no embargoes or anything like that. Um, we publish typically three um, free to access editions. So that's PDF, HTML and usually XML as well. And then we sell paperbacks, hardbacks and some ebook formats at, at reasonable prices. Um, everything that we publish is, is rigorously peer reviewed, so at least two experts will review the full manuscript and often it's three. Um, and we don't have um, a BPC model, so some, I think it's diamond is one, is one term for this, um, this model. 
So basically, we don't charge um, authors to publish with us. We ask authors if they're able to source grant funding to support the publication of the book that they do so. But if they're not able to do that, then we will still publish the book. That's not a barrier in any way. Um, and likewise, if an author has the grant funding, but their book does not pass peer review, it won't get waived through just because they have the funding. Um, and also just a point to make uh, relevant to the business model. Um, if, over the last few years, ODP started working more in open infrastructure development. And we've come to see these as kind of two arms, basically, of our activities. Um, there's the publishing arm or division, uh, which we've published 212 titles to date. And in the last financial year, um, which is some of the figures I'm going to be talking about today, um, we published 35 books. Um, but we also have this open infrastructure development aspect of what we do. And uh, the, big, the largest part of that at the moment is our involvement in the coping project, which has been mentioned already today. Um, and that as aspect of what we do is entirely grant maintained and grant funded. So for the purposes of, um, of what I'm going to be talking about today, that's, that's sort of separate to one side. Um, and I'm going to be talking about the publishing arm and how that's um, funded and financed. So this is a kind of a breakdown of our revenue for the last financial year, which ran from uh, 1st of October 2019 to the 30th of September 2020. Or 30, yeah, 30th September. Um, so you can see it, basically this is how it breaks down. Um, sales is the largest chunk of this. So we sell paperback, hardback, um, EPUB and Mobi editions, um, at, at, as we say, at sort of reasonable prices. So we try and keep paperbacks around £15, each hardback's around 30 and uh, our e formats are 5 pounds um, Then grants and donations, that grey chunk. So that's um, in large part the title grants I was talking about. Um, there's such a small sliver of that is donations, but the, the majority of it is grants. Then the library membership is that blue square or blue uh, blue segment. So that basically is a, is a, um, a membership program that we uh, launched in 2015. And member libraries pay um, a, a fee at the moment to 300 pounds. I think it's been 300 pounds since we started actually. Um, and so in return for that fee, they get uh, some of the ebook formats that we charge for. They are able to access freely and anyone on their network is able to access freely. Um, they get some discounts on print copies, um, and we also try and provide other benefits, like I might go and speak at the, the library or the, the university about open access, or we provide uh, mark records. But really, the, the main kind of reason to join that is because you want to support the work that the press is doing, and you want to help to make more books open access. Um, and then the other sort of smallest sliver there, the orange sliver, title services revenue. So this is things like we ask authors to provide indexes for their books, and if they don't want to do that, then we charge them a small fee to do it. And this is just to break down the sales revenue because that was sort of the largest chunk. So this is the sales revenue by source. And you can see, I think the most interesting thing perhaps about this is that um, the largest segment is from our own website. That's the direct, the blue segment. And that's both print and ebook, but more print than ebook um, there. And then the next sort of um, the 25% UK retail, 33% the US retail, and the yellow 1% of Australian retail. So um, we use um, Lightning Source to publish our books on demand, and they have operating centres in the UK, US and Australia, but they, those operating centres serve regions greater than those. So for example, the US, um, US operate, operating centre serves North America, not just the US. Um, the UK one serves UK and Europe, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so all the sort of um, the print copies go through that, and then you have the 2% uh, library distributors, that's ProQuest and EBSCO, and then 4% uh, ebook retail, so that's places like Amazon. And then this is our production costs. So our revenue, you may have seen, was uh, 229k. Our production costs are 222k. So we made a 7k profit last year, so that was reinvested into the, the business. But obviously, the main thing there is that the, the revenue is larger than the costs, and so we can keep doing what we do. Um, so the biggest revenue, uh, biggest cost, sorry, by far you can see there is, is staff costs. Um, so um, I might, might talk a bit more about staff when I talk about um, our title copy costs. Um, so we also have printing costs and royalties. That's the, the next largest chunk. Um, overheads, that's things like rent um, and things like that. And then title production expenses. Um, title production expenses is things like where we've outsourced production. So most of our production takes place uh, in-house, um, but occasionally we'll outsource um, projects. And so that's that, that final chunk there. 
So thinking about first copy production costs, so this is total costs, less printing and royalty costs because they're associated with um, later with, with copies beyond the first copy, if that makes sense. And so if you take um, our costs and divide that by, or those costs, the, the, the first copy costs, and divide that by the number of books that we published, which last year was 35, then it, it shakes out at roughly um, 4,874 per title. Of course, that's not an exact total for each book. Um, and you can see that if you compare it to the standard publishing cost, which we put in our auto guide. Um, so that works out at 5,000 in terms of how we break that down. Um, and I think what's most interesting perhaps about this is that you can see that the bulk of the kind of investment, and this is mostly sort of staff time, um, goes into the kind of proofreading and typesetting, so the bits that make the books um, as best as they can be, I suppose. So we have a managing editor, we have two part-time editors of whom I'm one, I also do outreach work, and we have uh, somebody who does both editing and production, wears both hats. Um, we also have a production manager um, who focuses purely on production. And the production workflow runs basically through InDesign. So typically we'll edit the manuscripts in Word and then at the production stage, it will go into to InDesign. Um, and we also have a, a marketing library and distribution person who again wears those several hats in terms of um, getting the books out there and making sure that people, people know about them. Um, so then the distribution channels, um, I'm going to put the links in the chat when I finish. Um, the, the online document here is quite detailed and I think it will be useful if anyone's interested in the detail of this. Um, this is just a, basically a kind of overview. So obviously there's our own website um, from which uh, we sell about a third of our total sales via our website. Then there are nine metadata aggreg aggregators including Crossref. So that doc document there doesn't actually include Crossref, it says there's eight, but if you include cross reference, there's nine. 11 uh, retail and distribution platforms. So that includes things like Google Books. Um, it also includes places like Open, um, and then includes two that act as distributors to an international network of ebook retailers. Then there's two print distributors, so that's Lightning Source, who I've already mentioned, and Gobi. And then there's um, open educational resource platforms like Merlot and um, Open Text. Um, we produce multiple metadata formats, so our mark records are actually produced by the University of St Andrews Library, um, but KBAR Onyx um, we produce ourselves. Um, and in terms of metadata, it's worth mentioning again Copem here, I think, because one of the things that Copem is uh, interested in is metadata. And a kind of guiding light of the, of the Copem project as a whole is the idea of scaling small. So how can you enable more small publishers to operate? Um, and that collectively that, that's kind of what produces the scale. So one barrier obviously, as we've been talking about and have been talking about, been talked about in the chat, is this factor of distribution and metadata can often be a, a sort of very tricky part of this. Um, so what Copium is trying to do is to build an open dissemination system. And as far as I understand it, the aim is that uh, eventually you'll be able to input metadata of one type and convert it into another type so that you can um, basically produce multiple types of metadata um, easily. Um, and it's called SOS, and that little icon there in the corner is the uh, SOS logo. Um, and there's a link there which I'll share in the chat, which um, is worth um, checking out if you're interested in, in more of, of this project that Copen's working on. And of course, um, usage of our OA books is, uh, is the certainly most impactful um, in terms of raw numbers, in terms of distribution. So this is a graph which is part of a larger blog post uh, which I wrote earlier this year about usage. Um, it was, in, initially, I was interested in looking at our usage last year um, during the pandemic, expecting that this would have spiked massively, which it, it had increased significantly. But in fact, when I looked back, that usage was growing year on year. So my sort of conclusion from that was that we weren't looking at a kind of pandemic bubble of demand, which may then pop, but that we were looking at serious significant increases in the usage of our open access books year on year. Um, and there's a health warning about this graph. Um, so it, it compares three different platforms, but those three platforms actually um, track usage differently. So Open Edition tracks per chapter um, and the other two per book. So that's why Open Edition itself looks much larger in comparison with the other two. But what's interesting to me here and what I talk about in the blog post is the, the increase year on year on each platform rather than comparing the platforms uh, between each other. So in terms of licenses, um, for us, the author retains the copyright and OBP has a non-exclusive license to publish um, the book with a Creative Commons license. Uh, we generally recommend CC BY because it allows 
the greatest reuse. Um, but we also will publish other form, other licenses um, if the if the author prefers, for example, CCBY and CND or other CC formats. Um, third party content obviously is licensed separately. So within a CC license book, there might be um, or it's reserved or other types of um, licensed content. And Reaper particularly wanted to highlight the issue of takedown notices. Um, so this is problematic or can be problematic for um, open access publishers. So platforms, for example, YouTube, don't necessarily recognize or automatically recognize um, fair dealing or fair use exemptions. So you might have a book, for example, we had a book on musicology, which had over 100 um, excerpts of audio um, of musical content, which uh, we used YouTube to host. And initially, we got over 100 takedown notices for this content. Um, and we had to kind of make the case that, in fact, this was being used under fair use, fair dealing. Um, and uh, I think if we had lost more than three of, of you know, these 100 takedown notices that we were contesting, uh, we would have been banned from YouTube. In fact, we won all of them, um, but we had to make the argument, and there was that risk there that we could have been banned from YouTube um, for what we were doing. And of course, there's some um, copyright changes, uh, changes in copyright law coming down the tracks in, I believe, the EU and the US, which would put more of the onus on platforms to regulate this sort of um, perceived infringement, not necessarily fair use, but, but other types of infringement on their platforms. Um, so obviously, that would create then the incentive for those platforms to be even more stringent in their, um, in their uh, approach to take down notices. And, um, Reaper also wanted to make the point that fair dealing or fair use exemptions are things that haven't been fully utilized by publishers either, for similar reasons, I suppose, as, as the idea of the platforms being cautious. Publishers don't want to get into legal trouble. But as a result, we've kind of almost artificially limited the extent to which we can take advantage of fair dealing and fair use through um, this sort of caution. So that's uh, everything, more or less, I hope. Um, this, these are sort of the references uh, to the, the things that I was talking about, those blog posts and things, and I'll share those in the chat now. Um, but I hope that all made sense, and I hope it didn't go on for too long, Agata. Um, but yeah, thank you, everyone. Thanks for listening. Uh, thanks a lot, Lucy. And um, I, I think uh, there is some time for a, a question. Still, I'm, I'm going to try to to find it in the in the chat. It was about the the grant part. Ah, I found it. So uh, the question is, Lucy, uh, does the grant funding that I think you showed in one of the first slides uh, come to you as part of the manuscript submission process, or do you find uh, need, sorry, or do you find you need to partner with third parties or actively seek out where this funding is, the grant funding? So the grant funding usually comes attached to specific titles, and sometimes you find that you have authors who have already got the funding, they know all about it, and they pitch up and say, I've got this project and I've got this potential funding available. And sometimes it's something that we need to encourage authors to do because they're not always aware of the potential sources um, or where they might be able to go to ask either their university or their funder or, or other sources for, for grant income. Um, so it's something that we, we work on in collaboration with our authors. Okay, thank you. Um, I also had one question, but or I see someone raised his hand here. Uh, Noel Simmel, did you have a, a question that you would like to ask? And feel free to uh, unmute yourself. Oh, no, sorry, that must have been by accident. Oh, you maybe just wanted to say hello. <laughs> That's fine. Yeah, and thank you for the great talk so far. Th thanks, yeah, thanks for, for being here. And uh, we have one more presentation. So I also had a question, but I'll, I'll send it to you via the chat, Lucy, and, and everyone. Um, and um, then I would like to invite uh, Fulvio to speak about the uh, Crenza University Press. And um, yeah, please take your uh, time, Fulvio. Um, it will just mean that Agatha and I will have less time to speak at the end, but that's completely fine. So we can uh, see your screen okay. and now also hear you. Okay, hi to everyone. Uh, I want to thank oh, you. Sorry, for... Fulvio, I think now we cannot see it anymore. Or I see a, a black screen, could that be? Uh, Now you can see it? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I enlarge my, my presentation. Um, 
thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, this work was is very interesting. Um, I'm here to present to you our experience, uh, the experience of Firenze University Press on business model. I don't know if what I'm going to present to you, it will be uh, so much uh, as innovative as uh, the other presenters, but uh, this is what uh, we are doing the last uh, 20 years on uh, open access books. Um, uh, sorry, I put here. Uh, this is more or less, uh, so yes, a business model for what? Uh, this is more or less uh, our um, open access book uh, catalog. Uh, more than 1,000 books, over uh, 1,300 books. Uh, mm, we start to publish uh, uh, in uh, 2020, in June, uh, um, edited volume uh, with book chapters, only open access book chapters. And more or less, we cover 1,700 authors uh, from different uh, uh, research institutions and nations. We publish 80, 90 year, uh, books per year. Uh, um, actually, um, actually, we uh, we publish all our content uh, with um, a Creative Commons license. We are quite open to the kind of license uh, uh, we are going to use. Uh, mainly we use uh, CC BY. Uh, actually, in the last uh, two, three years, uh, we have used the CC BY alone, but uh, we are open to use either, either licenses, uh, even the uh, non-commercial and non-derivative licenses. Um, we publish um, uh, XML edition uh, that uh, in the two type of XML edition, a light edition with metadata and a full edition with the content. And we cover the metadata with a, 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 a license, a C0 license, a public domain license. Uh, we have published uh, um, on the website uh, and the connected to web edition, uh, 11 uh, uh, best practice. Uh, in which we describe uh, all the process, uh, uh, all the characteristics, processes, models of our publishing houses. So you can use it, this best practice to get other information. Um, uh, a, 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 a brief, uh, um, a brief words about the type of content uh, we have published actually. Uh, more and more, we have uh, uh, loose grasp on uh, uh, handbooks uh, and uh, study books and uh, educational books. And more and more, in the last year, uh, we have published uh, uh, monographs and edited books directly connected to basic research. And uh, um, actually, uh, um, the reason is that uh, uh, these kind of books are uh, can gain a lot from dissemination uh, and impact uh, from open access. Actually, open access can be an exceptional use if you want to uh, to get more dissemination and impact. Um, mm, this kind of model has uh, uh, has had the impact on the kind of book we have published. Um, as I said. Uh, what are we doing now before to, to, start, uh, to start speaking uh, on the business model? Uh, we are uh, um, deeply involved in uh, a three-year plan. We call it uh, Scientific Cloud for Books. And uh, 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 as what you read is uh, we try to apply open access book what we have learned on journals in the last 10 years. Um, uh, I think there's a lot of a lot to gain in this direction, dissemination of impact. And uh, actually, in my experience, um, authors, scholars, uh, 
uh, are starting to understand, recognize, uh, request, uh, uh, they recognize uh, open access as a tool to get more dissemination world around. Um, uh, actually, uh, the processes of evaluation of uh, research started in a lot of countries in Europe, in Italy, in England, in France, uh, in the last 10 years, have uh, uh, fostered this process. Uh, scholars need uh, to be evaluated, uh, to be evaluated well, need to be read, downloaded, cited, and so on. Uh, so we are working on that. And uh, actually, we are, um, we are working on that, working on major data. I'm, I'm, I'm interested to what uh, Lucy said about the, uh, the copying project and uh, uh, all the tools they are, work, they are preparing for dissemination and impact. Uh, I, I can back on that at the end. But uh, let's say something about the business model. Uh, what we are, we are a not for, for profit institutional publisher. Uh, uh, FUP, Firenze University Press, is a department of University of Florence. University of Florence is a, a quite big uh, a university in Italy, uh, is a public university. Uh, we have the same VAT number. Uh, so I am an employee of the University of Florence. Uh, University of Florence, uh, as I said, is uh, in the scale of the big university in Italy, uh, 50,000 students and a little less than 2,000 researchers, um, researchers and professors. Um, uh, our mission, our mission, uh, actually, we cover. We, uh, I'm here to speak about books, but we have uh, 50 journals. So our publishing activity is divided in two departments, actually, books and journals. Both open access, mainly. All the journals are open access, uh, 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 and the majority of the books are open access. Uh, our mission for books is to provide publishing services for authors of peer review books. Uh, I want to stress that any author with any research affiliation can apply to publish, can uh, submit a, a book proposal to Firenze University Press. Uh, you can find a lot of information here. This is one of the 11 best practices for uh, Fupin and uh, uh, Cost and revenue. Mm, our model is quite plain. Uh, as the uh, uh, department of the Firenze, of the Firenze University, uh, Firenze University Press is a cost center. Uh, we, we are not a non-profit entity, so we don't have to give any profit to anyone, the university too. Uh, we are a cost center and we cover our, our cost in a mixed business model. Uh, it has, we cover our costs with the institutional support of the Firenze University, with print revenue and uh, um, book pay charge, BPC. Uh, sorry. Uh, actually, the, the kind of model is quite uh, simple, it's not so innovative. Uh, institutional support of the, Firenze, of the Firenze University and the print revenues lower the cost of book processing charge. Uh, as you know, actually, um, you can call it as you want, book processing charge typically covered by founder of other research institution uh, in, uh, in, in Italy or other side. Um, How we, how we calculate the BPC uh, individually based on the, the kind of service that uh, we provide uh, to the author, to the series, uh, to another department or another university. When apply, when possible, uh, we don't apply uh, books for just in charge and uh, we apply a, a, a 11 months embargo. Uh, actually, 
I have to say uh, a small amount of our, of our yearly production is uh, uh, published with an embargo. Actually, we uh, publish 90% uh, uh, of our open access book uh, in uh, um, directly open access. Uh, we use the embargo system when we publish uh, something connected to study books, uh, and books, educational books, mm -hmm. actually. Um, um, our authors are not so keen to gain something uh, from uh, the books and uh, to uh, have royalties are, most in, are more interested in the uh, dissemination process that uh, open access can give to them. Uh, actually the last one, this is uh, the, the the percentage of the uh, of uh, uh, the cost covering um, uh, 58, 58 of the, co the our costs are covered by print revenue 16 percent or less and the host institution uh, cost of, um, from the uh, university of florence and the bbc cover more or less uh, 42 percent of our costs um, this is our experience, actually. Um, actually, uh, okay, I, 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 I am at the end of my presentation. Before to, to leave you uh, to answer your question, if you have one, uh, please uh, ask me about uh, all our future day that I, I don't have uh, uh, described. I would like to, I would like to uh, present something that is more a vision, okay? This is my idea, what is a book now, and what is going to be, actually. A book is like a, an iceberg. The, the, the part of the iceberg uh, uh, above the water is what uh, we like, what we read, what we evaluate, what, what we peer review, what we um, uh, give us feelings, but, uh, the underneath part are made data and uh, um, open access is an exceptional tool to disseminate books uh, using metadata. We need, uh, actually, we need uh, infrastructure on metadata and dissemination, I think that. Um, uh, the nice things of this uh, situation is that uh, uh, Open access uh, publishing model is uh, affordable for a small publisher, actually, for a scholarly publisher, for community publisher, for a publisher connected to university as we are. Uh, um, if you are able to get more infrastructure on metadata and services on metadata, services uh, to gain a dissemination impact, um, I think that uh, uh, we can get more and more and more interest in researchers. Um, actually, we have spent a lot of time, Europe has spent a lot of time and money. Uh, we are in, in the last day, in the last 10 years uh, on advocacy and uh, this has been really important, but uh, what I experience every day at, uh, is that uh, uh, a lot of our authors, editor-in-chief, uh, uh, authors, uh, authors, uh, edit edited volume, um, uh, leading project, uh, uh, some, uh, they know something, they know the name open access, uh, they, they have heard something about open science, uh, but they are really keen and they have understand that, that, that this strange thing, open access, is a, a, a beautiful, a simple, a cheap tool to gain uh, dissemination. And uh, this is the, 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 uh, the aspect that, that uh, we need to uh, use to, to foster uh, open access model for uh, book two. Thank you very much. I end my presentation here. Uh, thank you very much, Fulvio. And uh, thanks for taking the time at the end to first of all, make the connection uh, to metadata from your presentation and, and back actually to what, what Lucy mentioned also about this. 
and also actually bringing back the, the whole reason why we're talking about business models uh, to, to make open access for books work and to uh, deliver on the, the great impact it can have. Um, uh, again, again, we don't have that much time, but there's a question from the audience, Fulvio, for you, uh, which is the, the following. Uh, does the uh, university have, uh, or the university press, have different funding models for Firenze University offers compared to non-Firenze University offers that you published? Uh, or, and, and if so, do you have a quota of how many of each you will publish? No, we haven't. This, I think this is a quite interesting uh, uh, point. Uh, thank you for asking about that. I, I haven't stressed that. Uh, uh, we have only one price list, actually. So uh, in, the, in our model, uh, uh, there is a transfer of uh, uh, actually value and uh, uh, money from the university, uh, uh, university of Florence and the network, the world network of uh, scholarly publishing and uh, research. Uh, so th this is a, a, an important aspect. We don't have two price lists from mm -hmm. uh, 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 Florence affiliation and non-Florence affiliation. So. Okay, Th thank you very much, Fulvio. I hope that answered the, the question. Um, since we have uh, 10 minutes, and I know that uh, Agatha also wants to have some of that time. If anyone has further questions, please use the chat uh, as you have been doing uh, for this whole session already. And then I would like to hand uh, back over to Agatha for the, uh, the wrap up of the presentation today. Thank you very much, Tom, and thank you to all the presenters today. It was, it was really fascinating. And I would also like to thank all the people who were contributing to our chat because the chat has gone wild it has its own life so we will do our best to actually also share the transcript of the chat there are some uh, quite fascinating discussions there going on about paul and jane and so on it's 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 really quite uh, quite entertaining so make sure to to have a look at it um what i would like to do now is uh, i would like to tell you what it is that we are hoping to do in the future um so let me just i just have perhaps three more slides that I would like to share with you. So just uh, let me do that. Um, or perhaps it would actually be easier to start with the polls, sorry. So I wanted to, to tell you that this um, workshop is just on the first one in the series um, that we are planning to have. So there will be two upcoming workshops. And for these two upcoming workshops, we wanted them to have a sort of uh, a different setup. So this one, as, um, as you have seen, was uh, very informative in nature, and it was not that much interaction going on. It was just presenters and then uh, some time for questions. So for these two upcoming um, workshops, we would really like them to be workshops, not webinars. Um, so we would like to have smaller groups of people talking uh, and discussing uh, more specific questions um, that uh, are within the scope of these um, of, the, of the, the issue of business models for open access books. So we prepared um, three questions for the poll. I will launch the poll now. So if you could just please answer them because we would like to hear from you what it is that you would like these upcoming workshops to be focused on. What are your particular areas of uh, interest and so on. So if I, I'm launching it right now and if you wouldn't mind uh, answering that would be absolutely fantastic. Um, about the upcoming workshops, one more thing is um, we are we are actually. Um, can you see the poll? By the way, I hope that you can. Yes. Uh, great. Okay. Uh, so for the upcoming workshops, we are planning on having them sometime in late April or uh, in May, and we will make sure to inform all of you when uh, about the exact dates, dates of these workshops and uh, the exact scope, because of course, also based on your feedback that we get from you today here, uh, we will tailor them uh, accordingly. Um, Tom, is there anything else that I should be saying that I forgot about? Um, well, uh, let me think. No, I, I think that um, also after today, uh, maybe later this week or next week, we will uh, come back to you and, and send you a, uh, an email about today's session. But also, uh, once we know more about how the second and the third workshop uh, will take shape and what we plan to do there. And as Agatha mentioned, it will be slightly different from today. It will be more uh, in-depth 
uh, small scale and looking at a more detailed level at some of the uh, business models and topics we uh, discussed uh, today and where we have heard um, yeah, six different approaches that uh, are already being implemented and used uh, for a long time uh, in practice. Great, I'm going to end the poll now, uh, just to give you an idea also of what the first, uh, first uh, answers here are and uh, who is leading in the polls. So I'm ending the poll. Uh, let me see. So we asked you for the two workshops to be organized within the next few weeks. Um, what would uh, you like the main emphasis to be? And definitely you would like them to be focused on different business model types. Um, okay. Then we asked you if you would be interested in participating in a smaller and more in-depth workshop. And um, if so, um, what kind of business models you would be most interested in to look into more depth. And uh, an absolute winner of this poll is the library coalition model. Very nice. Uh, that's actually quite good to hear because this is also something that we had in mind. So that's great. And then the third question, uh, if you would be interested in participating in a smaller and more in-depth workshop about the specific aspects of business models, which one would be uh, most interesting for you. And here the clear winner, interestingly enough, is workflows, production and distribution. Thank you so very much for these. Um, so I'm sharing them with you. Um, and uh, Tom, this is uh, our food for thought for the next, next workshops uh, to come how we will organize them and we will keep in touch with you. So you will definitely be aware of when exactly the workshops will take place. Thank you so very much again, especially to our presenters, but, but also to all the audience. We did not expect that so many of you will join us here today. So um, I'm glad that Rupert has upgraded our Zoom account. Uh, thank you very much for that as well. Um, and uh, we hope to see you very soon, probably still in April for the second workshop of this series.